Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. We're live on a Monday. Wow, 12 noon uh, for Energy 808, the uh, cutting edge. We're calling this particular episode La Energy, La, La Energy Potpourri. That's French. And, and the, uh, the tagline of that is recent energy news and developments, of course, with our dear friend Marco Mangelsdorf, who joins us from Honolulu International Airport. Hi, Marco. Well, as they say on the streets of Geneva, where I lived in the mid-1980s, may we, and konnichiwa, and thank you for having me. They never said konnichiwa in Geneva. No, I, I know well enough to know that. The French I can, I can get along with, though. Okay, uh, La Première uh, is changing the guard in the House Energy and Envir Environment Committee. This is a significant change in, in a legislature which is under fire, you know, according to the people who are reporting on CONCON -Con and the, the things that the people who want CONCON -Con would like to change about the legislature. So the legislature this year, we have a new, a new chair of the most important committee for this show, the House Energy and Environment Committee. You want to report on that, Marco? Sure. This is something that was reported last week in the Star Advertisers, and it's important to note that it's not a done-done deal because the election, uh, the general election, is not taking place. That'll be in 15 days from now, and that will uh, most likely lead to um, Representative Chris Lee being reelected because he's in the uh, the House, the Hawaii House, and they come up for reelection every two years. And also Nicole Lowen from uh, Kona side of the island. She's been Chris's vice chair in the EAT committee, Energy and Environment Committee. So uh, most likely both Chris and Nicole, who's Nicole's running without opposition, by the way, most likely they will be reelected. And if that's the case, uh, apparently Chris is moving to the Judiciary Committee and uh, Nicole would step up from the vice chair position to the chair position for the EEP mm. committee. You know, Chris has been the uh, EEP chair since, I'm going to say, roughly 2010-ish when Mina left, uh, when she was tapped by uh, Neil Abercrombie to be the chair of the PUC. So Chris has been there for about eight-plus years. So this is a you know significant tenure on Chris's part. And, uh, I think very highly of Chris, and I also think very highly of Nicole as well. So uh, I have great hopes uh, and expectations that Nicole will be a, a winner in the EAP committee as well. And you know, uh, there are far too many men uh, who are in the energy field, uh, and uh, I'm always happy to see uh, a woman uh, step up to an important position like that, and she'll be joined uh, on the Senate side most likely by Senator Lorena Noe, who will most likely be, continue to be the chair of the Senate Energy and Transportation Committee. So hopefully what eluded Chris and Lorraine over the past three years in terms of a tax credit specifically for battery storage, hopefully uh, Lorraine and Nicole uh, come the end of the session sometime in May, uh, early May, late April next year, uh, will be able to get across the finish line a battery storage bill, which uh, I think would be very good for all concerned. Okay, I have a bunch of questions I'd like to unpack with you. Um, so Chris was supporting the, the credit for the, uh, the uh, battery, uh, the battery uh, tax credit, right? He was supporting that for batteries. Why, why would things look better now? Well, Part of it, I guess, Jay, is it's, it's wishful thinking on my part that the combination uh, that we've had for the past three years uh, you know, evidently wasn't enough to bring it across the finish line in terms of getting it out of conference committee and to the floor for a vote at the end of the session. So uh, there's no disparagement towards Chris, but uh, sometimes uh, things need to be shaken and not stirred in James Bondian terms to, uh, to get some results. So. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, Nicole and Lorraine will be able to do what Nicole and Chris, uh, group with Chris and Lorraine have not, were not able to do for the past three years. Yeah, and as we'll see with uh, later points in our show, um, this could be very important for the development of solar in the state of Hawaii. So, you know, is it that um, going from the uh, Energy Committee in the House to the House Judiciary Committee is something desirable? Um, you know what? What? What is? What is attractive about it? Why would? 
why would Chris want to go there? Or putting it another way, why would he not kick and scream to stay in energy? Well, that's a question for Chris, and I certainly don't have any. I haven't spoken to him about this news, uh, so I don't have any first-hand information. I can only surmise uh, that maybe he was ready for a bit of a change. I mean, he's a real bright guy, and uh, the Judiciary Committee uh, chairing that is no uh, no uh, slouch in terms of, uh, you know, juicy, interesting stuff in terms of uh, how the state judiciary uh, shapes up, so maybe Chris was, you know, ready for a change and ready for a new challenge. Uh, but you know, it'd be great to have him back on the show and can ask him directly. Yeah, I agree. Now, you 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 seem to assume that uh, Lorraine and Oway was going to stay as chair of the Senate Energy Transportation Committee. Is is that is is that been announced, uh, or are you just assuming that for the lack of an announcement to the contrary, she will stay? Uh, the latter. I I don't have any reason to believe that Lorraine is going to another committee chair position. I haven't spoken to. I saw Lorraine at an event a couple weeks ago, but I didn't ask her specifically. But you know, barring any uh, any change of view or, or desire on her part, I know she's interested in both energy and transportation. She also uh, one of her important bills has been for the past session or two to have a new transportation um, oh, airports commission, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that uh, I know is, is something important to her. It's, it's a high priority, and she was not successful uh, last session. So, yeah, as far as I know, Lorraine is going to be uh, in the, the same position, uh, you know, unless uh, uh, she decides to, to, to go somewhere else. Hmm. All this has to be taken in light of the, uh, the impending vote on CONCON. We don't have Con Am, the educational amendment, anymore. That was strict, stricken by uh, the Supreme Court on Friday. Um, but, but we do have CONCON up on the ballot coming soon. And one of the big issues is, uh, you know, is the system broken so bad that we need a constitutional convention? And the people who discuss that, you know, seem to be saying, um, you know, and really, it's, the jury's out on how people are going to vote on this thing. There, the polls uh, seem to favor, and the ads on television seem to favor not voting for CONCON, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of action here that suggests that people will vote for CONCON. Uh, and CONCON is directed in large part at reforming the legislature. Uh, term limits, for example. Um, or, you know, things around the uh, conference committee procedures. Uh, who knows what? Um, but, you know, what I find interesting is that the public view of the legislature is, is way low. Uh, Twenty percent of the of the people surveyed liked the, the way the legislature functions, and the rest didn't. So uh, we, maybe we need reform in the legislature. Maybe people will see that as a key issue in the concon. Uh, who knows? But we we need to have this discussion uh, after the vote on uh, election day. Anyway, let's go to point two, um, and that is utility ownership models. Uh, some some what two or three years ago. Uh, DBED uh, led a contract um, for consulting with Boston Consulting and London Economics on um, the uh, appeal, the, the, the uh, uh, propriety of um, different ownership models for utilities. And we have been waiting for Godot. This is a $1 million plus report that is supposed to be uh, returned to DBED. I don't know what the deadline is, but um, it, uh, it, may, it may already have, have sort of uh, lost its relevance. Um, but what, what's the status? Uh, where is this uh, you know, happening, Marco? And what do you expect? So in 2015, the legislature passed a bill that was signed into law by David Ige, appropriating about a million bucks to have DBED uh, do a request for proposals, which they did. Uh, looking at utility ownership models, and this was in light of the uh, long uh, process of uh, the Public Utilities Commission considering whether Hawaiian Electric Industries was going to be purchased by Next Era Energy in Florida. So this went out to bid, and the bid was won by uh, a couple of companies, Boston Consulting and London Economics over on the East Coast, to go ahead and spend uh, a million bucks and change uh, to look at uh, utility ownership models. And these folks have been going on uh, various meet and greet tours 
uh, two of them that I'm aware of in the past year or so. And then their third is going to be next month, which uh, they've announced they're going to be going around the state for one last Q&A, essentially. Uh, prior to uh, all expectations are that the report would be submitted to the legislature prior to the opening of the legislature in January, which is typically right around the middle of the month. And what I believe is going to be the case is uh, the, the, the report, and I don't have any for, uh, foresight or, or particular inside information on this, but my reading of the tea leaves is that the report's going to be extremely heavy towards looking at the new shiny bobble in town, which is performance-based rate making, or PBR, performance-based rate making, uh, uh, which uh, there's a docket open right now uh, with the commission looking at PBR. And uh, I, I fear that there, the, this million dollar plus study is gonna give short thrift to uh, the co-op model. It's gonna give short thrift to the muni, municipal model, uh, and probably spent a lot of his time looking at performance based rate making because uh, at the, the Verge conference uh, back in June at the Hilton Hawaiian Village, which I attended to, along with a bunch of other energy stakeholders, uh, the, the Boston consulting folks were there in force and they seem to be just going on and on and on about TBR. So uh, I, I hope that it is a holistic, comprehensive research piece that doesn't just get a, a mention in the Pacific Business News and, and the, whole, uh, the Star Advertiser and then it's put on the shelf, but that it really does contribute something substantive and thoughtful to the dialogue in terms of what some of the best uh, options are for, for running our utilities here. So uh, I, I hope that they, 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 they do a good job and I hope they give the taxpayers uh, our collective money's worth. No, I, you know, that's, uh, that's what lingers for me, the million dollars. Here, this uh, PBR initiative was, uh, was a matter of the, the, PB, the PUC uh, on its own motion, opening a docket to look into uh, PBR, performance-based rate making, and also the legislature, which I thought was kind of a duplication of effort, uh, asking the PUC to look into PBR after the PUC uh, had already decided to look into PBR. Now we get a third uh, voice, if you will, on PBR. And that is this, um, this report uh, for a million dollars. Uh, gee whiz, uh, it comes from three sides. And I am uh, likewise uh, amazed that, there, that when you say the ownership models, and you say this report was intended to evaluate possible ownership models, it doesn't appear to be doing that. Um, and you know, certainly you have an interest in that as the, uh, are you the chief executive or one of the, one of the founders of HIEC on the Big Island? Um, it's really interesting that they don't even, don't even sound like they're going to address that. Um, so here we have another voice on PBR, um, which is being covered roundly by the PUC and with very competent staff and help there and two new commissioners who presumably are well familiar with it. Uh, now we have uh, this um, consulting group, two consulting groups from the mainland. You know, in my observation, maybe it's just me, when I see these consulting groups coming around and having all these meetings in Hawaii, what they do is they, they listen to what everybody says and, and then they effectively regurgitate it back to us and they charge a lot of money. And I, and I wondered about the um, usefulness of this report when it was first initiated. So now after three years, we have something that uh, arguably is no longer relevant because we already have a PUC docket on it. Uh, I don't get a good feeling on this whole scenario, if you want to know, Marco. Gee, I couldn't tell, Jay. <laughs> okay. What does that mean? You agree or disagree? Well, I, you know, I want to see the report, and, uh, and I, want to be, uh, I want to be provoked by it in terms of something provocative and not, you know, not the usual pablum. Uh, because I think it's a very interesting time for utilities now. I think it's a very interesting time for Hawaiian Electric and the five islands that they serve across the state. Uh, and I would like to see something uh, from these this consulting bright minds that uh, causes some serious discussion. I mean, uh, one of the juiciest uh, questions to me is, you know, is, is it time you know, to, to move away from what has been typically referred to as cost of services model 
which investor-owned utilities have have been over the years, which is they have a cost of what they provide, right? And they are uh, they are assured, or I should say, they are permitted a certain return on that cost that the Public Utilities Commission establishes that thou shalt make up to X percent return on equity, uh, but no more than. So the PBR uh, and the co-op model are, are very different approaches to running a utility company. I'm, so, I'm always concerned when I see um, you know these sophisticated questions being handled by um, not one but two consulting groups on the mainland when we, we are in fact conducting our own PUC proceedings here. Because uh, you know at the end of the day I have to say maybe this sounds very local of me but I um, I think this is a local issue best appreciated by local regulators um, rather than uh, consultants for a million dollars. And, and I said before to you uh, that, you know, if they had only offered me the, the million dollar contract, I would have been happy to do it for a lot less than a million dollars. And on that note, uh, why don't we take a short break and contemplate it all. And when we come back, we're going to talk about utility scale solar and rooftop solar and, and which, which one is moving where. We'll also talk about um, PGV and what's going on with geothermal. We'll be right back after this break. And aloha. My name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Hey, Stan, the energy man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're gonna talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're gonna definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Hey, we're back, we're live with Marco Mangelsdorf, moving right along. We have two other issues to discuss, and one of them is utility-scale solar against rooftop solar. The practical, and uh, which is which is more practical, and which is going to prevail as the you know I guess the the most um, uh, the most likely to succeed in Hawaii. What do you think? I think I'm conflicted, my friends, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because uh, I have a very personal stake, selfish stake and the continued health and viability of rooftop solar, which I've been doing uh, here in Hawaii for the past 18 plus years, but a total of 40 years when uh, I go back to my first solar job in the Bay Area, Cupertino, California, uh, back in 1978. So I, I'm committed to the idea that rooftop solar is a good thing. It allows people to have a, a wee bit more of energy independence. It gives them a really cool thing on their roof that they're producing some or all of the, uh, their own power that they need for their day-to-day -day needs. And it's just really, really cool. And I really believe in decentralized energy and solar is the best energy source to be able to do that by far. And yet, uh, the other side of me knows full well that the way of controlling electric rates if not bringing them down in price over time, which I think is, is even harder stretched in terms of a downward trend as far as electricity to the retail consumer, is uh, that one of the ways you do that is you bring down the cost of generation. And one way not to do it, of course, is to spend more and more money or have uh, power plants that are based on burning some type of combustion fuel, uh, whether it's uh, oil, whether it's natural gas or coal. So utility-scale solar plus storage uh, we're seeing is uh, coming down, down, down in cost in terms of uh, the cost of solar has gone down significantly in the past years. The cost of battery storage is going down as well. So it, it makes more sense uh, for the uh, the economics to double down, triple down on the utility scale because it's going to be cheaper compared to rooftop. Yeah, no surprise really because uh, you, when you do larger in installations to have uh, economies of scale working for you, um, in, in every way, in, in, the, uh, in the cost of the panels, and the cost of the structure in which they rest, in the cost of the, uh, the labor and uh, all the fast 
fastenings. Uh, and um, I think, you know, arguably you get a better product when you have a contract that's controllable that way. I'm reminded of um, Puerto Rico uh, where we had a show. Uh, one side of this field of solar was installed by one installer and one was installed by the other installer. And uh, one of them withstood the hurricane completely and worked after the hurricane. The other one was destroyed. So it really makes a big difference in a large field of solar who does it. And presumably you can achieve a better result if you have, you know, a top flight installer and top flight uh, fastening uh, equipment. But anyway, uh, the other thing I was going to mention is, um, you know, th there's been pressure already um, on, on the industry, on the legislature, on the PUC uh, to, to, to move to that economies of scale. And I think we're seeing it realized now. Um, and I think that probably you'll see more of this large uh, utility scale solar being installed. Uh, it's a financing question first. You know, when nobody had the money to install solar, well, let the, let the uh, homeowner, the you know, single family homeowner, raise the money. And um, that's the way we finance the installation. But now apparently they, they, they have systems and uh, financial arrangements where they can raise the money uh, at, the, at the utility level, uh, you know, using uh, the RFP method. And gee, they, I don't, they don't seem to have any problem raising the money. Therefore, they don't have any problem doing the projects. What do you think? Well, in fact, it's not ratepayer money. It's not utility money uh, that's, that's being ponied up. It's outside investor money. And we learned uh, last week, I believe it was the week before, that one of the winners uh, of the uh, seven winners, I believe it is, for the uh, multi-megawatts worth of solar plus storage in the last RFP round that One Electric did, is a company called Inner, with an I, Interjects out of Canada. They are going to be providing 30 megawatts of uh, PV on the Big Island plus 120 megawatt hours of storage, and they're also going to be providing 15 megawatts on on Maui with a smaller amount of storage. And we don't know the price yet. That's still, I guess, subject to negotiation, but we'll know probably by the end of the year. But you know, it's likely to be somewhere in the seven to eight cents a kilowatt hour range. And you know, by comparison, uh, the uh, retail rate on the Big Island this month is right around 36 cents. And, and, and up and higher than that. Wow, that's a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's been emerging since the day when you and I first met each other and started talking about these subjects. Fact is that uh, solar, whether it's rooftop or whether it's, uh, you know, utility scale, solar is the winner. Uh, there are so many other possibilities. Uh, you could name them on two hands, um, you know, for renewable energy, but solar has emerged in this state. And in, I guess in the world as the winner for green energy. Um, but anyway, that, that, that opens this, the discussion about geothermal. Geothermal is still not operating at uh, Puna uh, Geothermal Venture. Um, the roads haven't been completed to get there. But there are those who say it's not hard to reopen. Um, or Matt uh, says that they can do it uh, because they set it up so it's easy to restart. But a lot of people are, question that. And, and of course, the overriding consideration is the contract they have may be too rich. And that if we look for cheaper energy, um, that's not a solution. Um, so there are those who oppose uh, reopening them. Um, what, what's the sense of the public uh, from your point of view in Hilo? Uh, what, how do people feel on the Big Island? Jay, before I go there, I just want to briefly say that, uh, you know, in defense of rooftop solar, that yes, again, utility scale solar is cheaper. There's no doubt about that. But uh, all the stakeholders, including Hawaiian Electric and the governor and the legislature and the PUC and ratepayers, want to see more rooftop solar. So the question is, what's the best blend? What's, how, it's a very dynamic mix, and, and how do we move forward? So now talking about PGV, I attended, uh, along with a number of other people, a talk a couple weeks ago at Imi Loa Astronomy Center at the UH Hilo campus, uh, where Mike Calacchini, who's kind of the general manager there for ORMAT at PGV, Mike was there, my friend Jay Ignacio, President of Helco, and my friend Warren Lee, former President of Helco and now President of Honua Ola, which is the renamed uh, Honua, oh gosh, Huhonua plant, which is going to burn biomass, assuming they make it through the last hurdle. So, 
Uh, Mike's position was uh, has been the same these past months, and he said so again in public that Ormet has every intention to restart the plant, but uh, it's going to be, you know, I would say uh, a ways out there, and there are a whole bunch of stuff, and, and a lot of money have to be spent. And one of my principal critiques, the two of them actually, is uh, the as you alluded to first 25 megawatts of that plant are under a so-called avoided cost contract, which is most definitely not in the interest of ratepayers, and I don't believe will ever be. If anything, it's going to get worse in terms of the uh, uh, the, the cost to, to ratepayers to do avoided cost. And second, by the, the uncertainty of PGV, will it come back or won't it, uh, going on month after month and conceivably year after year for the next couple, three years, it, in, in effect, in my opinion, kind of freezes utility grid planning uh, for HELCO, uh, and as far as it's a substantial amount of firm power, will it come back or won't it come back? And uh, ultimately, I think a key decision point is going to be from ORMAT sometime around 12 months uh, after the, the plant was shut down in early May of this year. So we're looking, you know, sometime early May will be 12 months have gone by, and uh, maybe at that point ORMAT will recalculate or reconsider given you know the circumstances at the time, road closures, what's it going to cost to do it, what's the regulatory uh, environment like. I mean, the, the commission, the PUC could open a docket on the, the benefit or lack thereof of PGB coming back. Now, they can't unilaterally void a power purchase agreement with their own, with their own authority, but they could certainly, it's their own discretion to open a docket on virtually anything, especially when it comes to important energy matters like that. So. Uh, I think the jury's still out whether PGV is going to come back or not, but I would say from now until uh, early May, uh, it'll probably be uh, hopefully more clear uh, in terms of whether it's uh, whether it's still in the in the cards or, or not. Well, you know, Marco, you say the jury's out. The jury's out on all of the issues we talked about today. The jury's out on every single one of them, and and that's why it's so it's so good to be able to talk to you and catch up. Uh, and, uh, and check the progress of each one of these issues going forward. So we will discuss it again, every single one of them, and we'll try to keep people current on what's going on uh, in uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge uh, here on ThinkTech. Thank you so much, Marco. You rock in the energy world today. We'll keep, we'll keep on keeping on. All right. Have a good flight. Talk soon. Thank you, sir. Aloha. Okay. Bye-bye.